What's up? My name is Austin Coop, and I'm here to show you the mixing and mastering process behind a song called I Don't Care If You're a Monster by Matt Caracas. So I've been working on this record with Matt for a while now, and every time he sends me a new demo, I always have a lot of questions like, you know, inspiration, direction, vision, where do you want it to go? And every time he just doesn't have a whole lot of answers, and he just says, listen to the rough mix. That was my vision. I want it to sound like that, but I want it to sound better. So I think to start off, Let's just check out the rough mix and see where he was at with that. And then we'll, we'll talk about the mindset in, in starting the mix and what we need to do based off the rough. When I listened to this rough mix when I first got it, I knew instantly, like, the drums and the bass are going to be the most important part of this mix because it's so bare bones. It's the groove, it's the rhythm of everything that's really going to carry the track. And I'll even show you, you know, I'll skip through the track a little bit and you can see... We're keeping that beat the whole song you know, snare on two and four. So it's really not a super complicated track. And like I said, that means that the elements that are there that are bare bones, you know, they're, they're really important. So I knew that the drums and the bass were gonna be the most important part of this mix. And I was gonna have to spend a lot of time on that at first. And then all the elements could kind of fall into place after that. So let's take a second and kind of take a look at the overall drum sound and I'll kind of break down what my mindset was. So we're looking at the verse here, and what Matt is going for on this new record a lot is kind of blending acoustic elements with electronic elements. So half of this drum sound is a live kit that he performed, and the other half is like programmed um, electronic, you know, kick and snare and some hi-hats, and I'll kind of show you that now. Things like this as well. And then here's more of like the natural kit. So we're really blending elements here. And the goal with it is to just kind of not go too far in either direction and really make it feel like a hybrid. Something really cool that we ended up doing on this track is we, we were looking for laser toms is what we called them. We couldn't really figure out for a second, you know, what those samples were called. Eventually, I believe it was called, um, I believe Synthwave or something along those lines. Can't really remember to be honest, but here's every tom spot in the song we layered this in there. Or almost every tom spot. Pretty sick. About the drum picture, there's a lot of things that I want to break down here because you wouldn't think that it would be super complicated by listening to the track, but as you can see, I've done my own job of complicating it. <laughs> Reason being, I didn't want to use a whole ton of automation with this drum sound because my mindset was taking the same source and just completely processing it differently for different parts of the song. So the verse, I'm processing the overheads completely different than the chorus. And in the verse, I'm not even using the, the room tracks at all. And I'll kind of show you how the overhead tracks versus the direct mic and how I'm using that together. So here's everything direct. Now here's with the overheads, which is gonna really give it that live kit feel. Here's without it. So that's where we're getting all of that, you know, drum vibe from. And I'm just gonna kinda go over what I was doing to the overhead tracks, and I'll show you with no processing what that sounds like. Just a little bit of excitement there. I'll take it all the plugins off and we can go through it. I'm really just using an SSL channel strip just to kind of EQ 
And uh, I believe there's this cool little knob here, the THD. It's a, uh, you know, harmonic saturation. I'm not exactly sure if it's even or odd. I can't remember, but I love pushing this when I just want to like dirty up a sound a bit. And I'm even dirtying up the sound more by going right into Decapitator. I love the E setting for this track. It just really brought the air out. And I'm pushing the drive quite hard, but I'm bringing the mix down, you know, just over 50%. So it's doing a lot there. And this is with the EQ afterwards. And my mindset with this EQ was just taking off all of this low end that's gonna be in the direct mics, especially with it having that electronic vibe and sculpting out where I think that low snare from the, the real snare and the electronic snare is gonna have that thud in this area. And you know, some annoying frequencies I thought needed to go. And that's our basic drum sound during the verse. What I wanted to do with this track is really liven up when it got to the chorus and really make... So before I expand on that, I want to just say, like, there's not a whole lot of dramatic compositional changes. So what you can do is you can take the way that you mix these drums to make it feel dramatic. So going into this chorus, I'm using a completely new chain for my overheads and I'm adding in the room tracks on a drum fill right into the chorus. So what I'm doing is I'm duping my overhead tracks and you'll hear verse versus chorus overhead tracks. I lose a ton of low end and I gain a little bit of high end and that's okay because what I want to do is I just want to get a touch more air and crunch out of the, the transient of the drums when we get into the chorus but I'm bringing in my room tracks now so that's going to kind of take up all that space that I took out. Here's with everything one more time. So when I'm approaching it that way, I can mold the drum sound to feel completely different. And doing it that way is a lot better than automation to me because you'd have to automate so many different parameters and plugins to really just go from point A to point B. Or it's much easier to just duplicate the tracks and just start from scratch and see how can I take this starting point and really mold it to this section of the song. That way you're going to create this sense of drama and we're gonna have some dynamic to the song instead of it being just a flat picture, the same sound, the whole song. That is gonna result in something feeling more boring, you know, and we, we don't wanna ever feel boring. And a simple, straightforward song and beat isn't boring if it's just, you know, put in the right context. One more thing I wanna point out that I thought was really cool about the drums was this little, uh, this trash rhythm that was sent. And I'll play you the original sound, and I, I'll tell you, I wasn't really a fan of the sound when I opened it up. I thought it was like pretty harsh on the ears and it was like kind of sitting in the same space as like the top end of vocals and the crack of the snare and all this stuff and I was like man that's like kind of harsh on my ears so I was like trying to think of what I could do and I'll go through this. I started with Little Alter Boy which is cool because you can do a lot of things with pitch, formant, um, saturation and what I ended up doing was just bringing the formant down. I still wasn't happy about that though. I felt like it was still very harsh. And something that I usually never do, but you know, stumbled upon was I put a gate on it and it took it from being this very loose, trashy thing to, it made it tighter and a little more percussive, which I really liked. So I really liked the source at that point. But I do understand that maybe that openness was the goal and that, that vibe was the goal. So to try to combat what I was taking away, I ended up throwing a new delay on there. And the delay to me was just a way to get that tight sound to still feel like it's filling space. And last but not least, 
I just EQ'd it, you know, took a whole lot of high end out, took a whole lot of low end out, scooped some high mids as well, some frequencies I wasn't enjoying, and really just tried to sculpt it into the mix in a way where I was like, okay, this is really adding the energy in the upbeat hi-hat vibe during the chorus, and I'm not getting the harshness. Here's without any processing on that. It just kind of really sits back in the mix and does its supporting role, gets out of the way of the vocal while still giving it that, you know, it enhances the drum beat. So let's go ahead and take a look at my drum bus without any processing on it. So with any drum mix that I'm doing, my first go-to thing is usually a distressor. And my settings that I typically like to use are 20 to one, really fast release time, typically the slowest attack. This one was a little more straightforward, so I brought it to nine. It just felt a little bit better to me. I set my side chain pretty high, so it's like not compressing super hard to the low end, kick drums and whatnot. And I'm always messing with the blend of my mix as much as I can, just trying to find the sweet spot of the compression versus the dry. I believe at one point my initial mixes, I had a lot more compression on the drum bus, and we found the sweet spot through some revisions, and um, this is where I ended up. This is with the distressor on the mix. It's just doing what compression does. It just grabs everything and brings it up and makes it exciting, right? And then I'm going directly into Decapitator. Like I said, the E setting for this song just really felt great. I'm not pushing super hard, just up to three, full mix. And then after that, this has been something that I've been absolutely loving. I got it from Eric Valentine on his YouTube channel, which is like priceless information for free. And Abbey Road Vinyl, just the default setting with the noise and crackle turned off. It just adds a little bit of top end and life and vibe, you know, which is what else do we want? You know, that's what we want. And then I'm going directly into Saturn, which is just doing more of the same. I'm just, at this point, I'm just stacking saturation. And instead of doing it a ton on one, I'm using stages just to kind of push it a little bit further. And each one has like a slightly different flavor that you can't get out of the rest. And to pull it all together, I'm using multi-band compression just to kind of manipulate the way the transients feel in the mix. I'm not thinking of it in terms of like, oh, I need to compress my low end and compress my high end and my mid range so it's even. It's really not about that for me. It's about using compression just to get a feeling and a vibe and a response out of the drums. It's not like a technical thing for me. It's just like, I know where the transient response is in these frequency ranges. How can I use compression just in there to get them to feel the way I want to in the mix? That's just what I ended up on. So that's pretty much my drum mix. Let's go ahead and check out the bass. The bass in this mix is pretty interesting because it's also something that doesn't sound like it's super complicated, but I made it complicated as well. And I'm utilizing multiple different sources to make up for this big, wide, deep sound. Matt provided me with just a normal bass DI and a synth bass right here. So this is what I was working with that he provided me. And I was stoked. I was like, that's great. I love that. Along the way, while I was working on the mix, I was just feeling like, all right, how can I get this to 
to fill the frequency space. Because remember earlier I was talking about how drums and bass are gonna be so important to make this feel interesting and exciting. I had to do something to just kind of bring that all together. And there's two things that I did. One of them was that I made my own recreation of Matt's synth bass and just kind of layered it in behind his. So here's the bass that he provided me and then I'll turn in the synth bass that I layered on top of it. It's a very subtle difference. This is the track soloed. And if you could notice, all that's really doing is just filling in the frequency space. It's not like I want that track to be perceived as there's another synth bass on here. I just want it to feel like what's already there is like taking up more space and creating that depth. And that's exactly what my mindset is on this next part where I'll show you how I duplicated the bass track twice. And what I did, I used UAD RAW, which is like a rap pedal emulation, and a waves doubler. And what I'm doing with that is I'm just trying to create this like stereo with dirty kind of muffled bass sound that I can just tuck in along with everything else. So here's the bass without it. And, you know, it's more of the same what I said earlier. It's just kind of packing in a little more frequency space in the low mids. It's giving a bit of a pick attack in a, in a strange way. You don't really perceive it to be a distorted bass sound, overly distorted in the mix, but when you play it... Give me everything forever. It just feels like a very deep, wide, kind of dirty but not distorted bass sound and I was really happy with where we ended up with that. For the guitars and the keyboards in this song, they're very much so the supporting elements in my opinion. That's how I viewed them when it came to mixing them and placing them and using them. They don't quite make their first entrance until the chorus. And I remember Matt told me, he's like, make, the, make it feel awesome and huge. And I even kind of went too far in that direction on the first few mixes and we kind of had to dial it back, find the sweet spot and find the right levels to just get everything to turn out exactly how Matt had envisioned it. Matt gave me DIs for this song and he also gave me amp tones that he tracked. We ended up using a bit of both. I ended up reamping, actually you can see it in the background there, uh, my Marshall JCM 800. And there's certain tracks in here that my reamp tones stayed and they ended up working great in the mix. And then there's certain ones where I went back to Matt's original I believe he used like a UAD Plexi model. Those ended up staying in the mix as well. So here's the uh, chorus guitar. And mix wise, there's not really much there to show. It was just a bit of light EQing, just cutting and boosting certain things. I do have a guitar bus here where something that I like to do a lot is mid side EQ to really manipulate the space the guitar sits in the mix. And this is my total guitar bus processing where I'm just kind of scooping mid range in the guitars to make space for all the things that, it's specifically in the mid channel, so everything that's mono. I'm only EQing that channel to just really make space for the bass and the drums because to me they're the most important and then there's a lot of Matt Matt's voice is very you know sometimes he'll get on some pretty low uh, notes and he'll be a little lower in the frequency space as opposed to a lot of people might be up in the high mids Matt sometimes gets down into the low mids so that's helping that too little bit of a harshness cut a lot of stuff up here can get a little tinny and fizzy and this Pro MB on the guitar bus is just for when on moments in the song where all the guitars come in just so it doesn't feel like the the low mids start to build up and jump out. I just want to keep those in one spot. I don't want them to be feeling like they're going all over the place when all the guitars start to stack. And then one of the cool things about the Marshall tone that I reamped is that when he told me to make it epic and big, I thought, okay, let's try to get some like nice drums. This is without any of the processing. 
I believe I reamped it with a, just a chorus pedal, like a boss chorus pedal, just very low gain. And to just kind of add that epicness, I sent it to a, a reverb and delay trail. Echo Boy for delay, Abbey Road's plate for the verb, just kind of getting all this stuff I don't want out of it. And we're doing the same type of thing in the second chorus and the bridge here. This ending of the song here are just completely Matt's tones from the rough demo. We ended up feeling like the way that he initially had it was totally fine and we didn't need to deviate from that. Let's take a look at the synth. So those big pianos and in, in the guitar, those strums and the pianos, they're all lining up and making that epic vibe happen at the same time. While we have a little bit of like a soft synth pad in the background, just kind of like letting that space really open up when we get to the chorus. It's a really big dramatic jump. Even when I was talking about earlier about the beat of the song being relatively the same, we're just adding all these elements and the way that we use them in the mix to just really jump into that chorus. Without the synth in there, you know, it really takes away that like sense of wonder, like, wow, we're in the chorus now. You can hear all this high end and it's like there's delays and we're getting some movement and modulation and without it, it just, you know, it's not as exciting. It's awesome. So let's talk about the vocals. This is actually a pretty interesting topic for me because when Matt sent me the files for the song, he included like this little video that he made where he's like filming his Pro Tools session and he's telling me, hey, every single vocal track has this processing on it. And it's Echo Boy Jr., very low mix on the ambient room setting. And he told me, he's like, every single vocal has this plugin on it and you need to do that. And I'm just like, okay. I didn't even know what it was gonna sound like. But when I do that, when I bring it in and I load up all the vocals, I understand what he's going for here. He, he wants the vocals to feel like this one big group in the room singing vibe. And here's what that sounds like. Give me everything forever or give me nothing at all. Take that. This is just one vocal track and I'll, I'll show you without that processing. Give me everything forever. And here's with. Give me everything forever, or give me nothing at all. It just, it puts him in a room, and that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So, that means that the vocals are super straightforward. I didn't have to do a whole lot to each channel. Matt laid that out for me. He's like, this is what I did. I love that sound. And I was like, all right, cool. So what ended up being interesting about this track is it was more about processing the entire vocal group together. So we've just been listening to my vocals with the, the bus processing turned off. I'll turn it on and we can see where we're at now. Give me everything forever or give me nothing at all. Take that for what you will. You know, typical things that would happen when you compress, brings everything closer, makes it more immediate and exciting. And I'm doing a lot of things here. So I'll go ahead and break down my vocal bus processing one by one. 
And this first plugin here is one that I found from Eric Valentine on his YouTube channel, which is amazing, like I said. It's basically like a very mu compressor. And I really like it because it does this thing where you get that saturation vibe out of it in that tube thing that happens when you use a very mu compressor. But when I started to use a lot of my other processing, like how I stack distortion, I realized I kind of wanted to stack the compression as well. So I ended up using my settings on slow attack and fast release, and I only used it at 50% mix. And after that... Give me everything forever, or give me nothing at all. Take that for what you will. UAD Poltec. And don't let it all go to your head. There's a form of weakness. I'm just boosting 100 and I'm boosting 10K. And what I love about the Poltec is it just has this way of like imparting that vibe and that slight saturation when you use it. It's a vibe EQ. You use it and it changes the sound. It's not transparent. And I really liked it for this application. And after that, per Matt's request, after, after working on this song and trying to find exactly the way that we wanted the vocals to sit, he tells me, I use the Legacy LA-2A. I love the medium compression setting. And I'm like, humoring him like, okay, let's use it. Let's hear how it sounds. And immediately, he heard a sound he was familiar with, and I understood, okay, I get it. I hear what you like it. Give me everything forever, or give me nothing at all. And we're driving that compressor super hard, which is kind of what ties back into bringing the mix down on the compressor that I had initially. And now that that's bringing everything up, I'm using a little bit of this right here. I think I heard a whistle at some point in time when there was like a lot of vocals lining up. And we've got some multiband compression to just kind of control the way that those vocals are coming out in the mix. You know, like once you get a sound like this where it's a bunch of vocals stacked, there's this thing that can happen where the frequencies just feel like they're out of control and they're certain words and frequencies just really resonate and jump. And the multiband compression just kind of helps to bring it to be a little more steady. And then I'm just using a de um, on the whole bus because I, I also put a de on each track, but then I just put one on the whole bus to kind of, um, you know, just kiss it. And then in the chorus here, we've got some background vocals that come in and everything just opens up in such a nice way. So that's pretty much it for the vocals. It's pretty much uh, just taking all the vocal sounds, simplifying them, and processing them as just one big group instead of individual tracks. The last thing I want to talk about is my mix bus and master bus settings. For this mix, I'm going out of the box into my Audioscape SSLG bus for the, my mix bus compression. What I like to do on my mix bus for this song, I really liked the 30 millisecond attack fastest release and I used it on I believe a ratio of two because I felt like that was my sweet spot. Four just felt like a little too much. I'm just really hitting about three to four dB of compression just to kind of get that mix bus vibe that happens when you use compression over the whole mix, especially from an SSL bus. This is a clone, but it sounds great. Something that I really like a lot that I found from watching some Michael Brower videos is this black box emulation from Plugin Alliance. And this thing is just amazing. It's just a total color box. I can't keep saying this enough. Like I'm always just looking for things to really fill the frequency space and like push it out of the speakers. And this is a plugin that really does that for me. I'll kind of show you a quick A and B. It's, it's subtle, but it, to me, it really adds so much. Give me everything forever or give me nothing at all. Take that for what you will. It 
is adding a bit of volume, but it's adding some depth and some saturation that is just really pleasing to my ears. And it kind of, where I feel like everybody's just always on the search of like imparting this analog vibe in the digital domain, you know? So I really love going out to my analog bus compressor and coming back in and trying to use certain saturation plugins to just kind of like emulate the vibe of analog gear, as do plenty of people. We're doing some multi-band on the low end and then the low mids. And to me, this is a little bit, you know, the, the low end of the multi-band is to kind of control the low end of the kick and the bass a little bit. My mindset on this is a little more technical compared to the drum set from earlier when we were using multi-band. But this low band right here, I just want that to really make sure that the low end is tidied up before limiting and clipping. Because once you start doing that stuff, your your perception of how much low end needs to be in the track might be way off after you start, you know, limiting everything. And then the, the low mid band here was really just to try to, that one was more to manipulate the way the drums felt in the mix. For what you will. Tightens things up, kind of brings them to life a bit. We've got some uh, some Fab Filter EQ, just kind of sculpting out some of these low lows that I really don't need, taking out a bit of the high stuff that I don't like. And then right here, this is a, another trick that I really like to use with mid-side EQ. Um, compared to earlier, the difference here is that I'm bringing out some of 975 hertz of only the sides over across the whole mix, because that's where I felt that Matt's fundamental vocal was at. And if you just bring that back about a dB, you can really give the vocal space right in the center, and it's it just really makes the vocal clarity a lot more easy to hear. A little bit of Saturn on here. For what you will. And don't let it all go to Saturn adds a lot. And this just goes back into what I'm just constantly repeating about stacking, saturation, in a way that you can just kind of push it a little bit by a little bit instead of just going too far. And it really adds so much to the mix and brings it to life in my opinion. And then the rest of it is where we're getting our, our loudness for mastering. This is with no clipping or limiting. So what I want to do with the clipper is I want to get a lot of transparent volume out of that. And I'm using Flatline for this, which I got recommended to it by a friend one time and I checked it out and I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to use that. What it's what's happening here is I'm just shaving off transients so that when I go to my limiter, my limiter is able to work in a little bit of a more transparent way as well, because when you usually throw a limiter in, it's gonna just absolutely react to your transients of this, the drum set, you know, the kicks and snares. It's gonna give you that pump that, you know, can be cool on certain things, but a lot of times that pump, that over compression feeling is like what ends up making your stuff feel a little bit lifeless and when people complain about no dynamics. So using a combination of clipping and limiting can really help. It can help you get that volume and sweet spot without getting you to pump. Even with using limiting, the sound of limiting is actually really great. I mean, everybody loves like a final mastered recording because it's got, we've, we've grown used to that limited sound. I and mean, it sounds awesome if you can use it without, you know, destructing things. There's a form of weakness, but sometimes I wish I knew what it meant to you. Take it. So when we're using the clipping into the limiting, we're, we're shaving off the peaks so that when we actually do use our limiter, we don't have to worry about this very up and down peaks and troughs going into the limiter, you know, reacting to things, making it sound pumpy. We kind of have a shaved off smooth thing for our limiter to react to. That way we can push it, get the volume that we need for mastering, you know, meet the commercial level that people want to hear music at. And this is where we end up. So that's been my mix breakdown of the song I Don't Care If You're a Monster by Matt Caracas. It's a really amazing song. I had a really amazing time working on it. 
I've been a big fan of Matt's stuff with whether it's Citizen or his solo music for a long time. So getting the opportunity to do it was really, really exciting for me. And it's been really, really exciting to kind of show you a, a deep dive into my process and mindset about mixing. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And thank you for watching.